of Eden is the force of ultimate evil. I think you've got some people that are in the in the Bible text that are trying to control us by keeping us from achieving this ultimate awakening, ultimate enlightenment, which is what, what the serpent of wisdom denotes in the Old Testament, as I understand it. I mean, everybody is perfectly willing to, to look at that, the book, the book of Genesis, and, and come to their own conclusions, and I hope that they would come to their own own conclusion, not the conclusion of what some guy standing there is telling them to think. I hope that individuals will do their own research, and perhaps the caller has done that, and with all due respect, I, I hope that she has. But what I find is that people just kind of dismiss this out of hand because somebody told them to do this since they were five years old, and they never question, why is that? Let's go back and see what, what this is really all about. Why is it that only the Bible only the Old Testament is the only text in the world that denigrates the serpent, and you know what? It also denigrates women. Hmm, is there a connection between those two facts? I believe that there is, because in all of the ancient spiritual traditions, especially the, the ones based on the divine feminine, the serpent was an ally. The serpent symbolized life force energy called kundalini, and as you raised the serpent, as you lifted the kundalini energy within you, you awakened your consciousness. So to dismiss the serpent is to say, I prefer to keep my consciousness closed and, and to not achieve the awakened or enlightened state. And, and then we also come on and say, well, what, what have these people done to women throughout the intervening centuries? Well, they've done the same thing they've done to the serpent. They've demonized the, the feminine half of our race. What's your take on the Garden of Eden, William? I think it's the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I think that they're describing that the, the Eden is a place of pure light and pure love, and using the as above, so below formula, yeah, there probably was a place somewhere in the Middle East, maybe in, in ancient Iraq, maybe ancient, uh, ancient Iran, where humankind originated. But the, the place that uh, the mystic tradition points to is the center of the Milky Way galaxy is the place of light and love from which we originated. And what I always encourage people to remember about the Garden of Eden story is that it was Yahweh, the Old Testament God, that evicted us from Eden. And when we were evicted from Eden, this place of pure light and pure love, Yahweh, or Jehovah, created a gate at the east of Eden and placed cherubim on either side of that gate and forbade us to return. And the second thing that he did that most people forget about is that Jehovah made coats of skin for Adam and Eve as he sent them out of the Garden of Eden. This suggests to me that our original state, once we were in that pure place, that Eden place, is we were light beings. And in a sense, you can think of the human body, the skin suit, is sort of like the orange jumpsuits that prisoners wear. And they identify with the orange jumpsuits. They become that, and they don't realize that they can escape that prison. They escape the prison by awakening their consciousness, by transforming, by uh, metamorphosing into higher beings. And that's what this is really all about. Next up, we go to Casper, Wyoming. It's Jamie's turn. Go ahead, Jamie. Hi, guys. A few months ago, I saw these things in church uh, buzzing around the people that were dancing and singing and worshiping and stuff, and I drew a picture of them, and they were they looked like big butterflies with tails, and I asked, hmm. I I prayed and I asked uh, my spiritual friend Mordecai. I told you about him one time, George. Right, right. And they said that they were gift bearers. So I was wondering if. Other than this picture of uh, the saint receiving the marks from Jesus, if there's any other traditions of the seraphim or the winged serpents having butterfly wings. Thank you. All right, thank you. What do you think? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question because, of course, the, the butterfly is the symbol of metamorphosis and transformation itself. And as, as I mentioned earlier, we're all in a pupil form here in the human body where we're seeking to become the metamorphosed, metamorphosed human which is symbolized by the butterfly. Uh, do I know of any actual beings that, that have butterfly wings? No, I haven't seen that. But whenever you see the butterfly, it is a symbol of transformation and metamorphosis. All right, it's Miami's turn. We go to Bob. Go ahead, Bob. Hello, Sam. Hi. Thanks for calling, Bob. Hey, go ahead. How are you doing, George? Uh, William, okay, uh, um, I'm going to, to, uh, to the book of Genesis, the 
first page, first three uh, 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 lines. I just want to get his his uh, just a translation of this. Okay. All right, William in uh, Genesis, of course. Oh, what do you think? I'm sorry. What's the question? Well, he's talking about the first three lines of Genesis, of course. In the beginning, God created. Mm-hmm. And is this what we're that? talking about? Yes. And you want me to comment on that? Sure, please. Oh, yeah, very fascinating. Uh, a scholarly argument has always gone about that. It is the first word in Hebrew is bereshit, and the, the scholarly argument was or is is does that word mean in the beginning or in a beginning? There's a huge difference between the two. And it seems that in part what it's describing there is a new chapter opening in human affairs. And it's fascinating to, to contemplate that because it suggests that there was a, another world before the creation of this world. And, of course, now today modern physics is all about that, saying that there have been perhaps many creations, that we live in a bubble universe within a bubble universe. And um, it's just fascinating to me. You know, the fallen angels, that whole story fascinates me as well. Something obviously happened, Mm -hmm. whether they were ETs that came down here or true angels who became evil, I don't know. Uh, But something dramatic happened a long, long time ago, didn't it? Without... Without a doubt, and at the core of it, in my view, I mean, based on the evidence of what of the research that I've been doing, there has been an effort since the beginning, the, the opening of this chapter, to deprive humankind of necessary knowledge and to make us a subservient race. And what I've been about in my research is trying to figure out what is that knowledge and how can we embrace that and what this knowledge is about is how we transform ourselves into light beings god beings or glorified beings and the faction that seems to want to control things on this planet is the one that says you are in no way entitled to do that and that to me is a negative scenario and I'm seeking to, to overcome that personally. I think a lot of people are seeking that. This is why they get frustrated with the church, because it, so the church is always telling them what they can't do rather than what they can do. And unfortunately, there's not a single Christian church that I'm aware of that is teaching how we can transform ourselves into beings of light. Yet that's what Jesus' message was directly all about. Okay, next up, we go to Mary in Ontario, Canada. Hey, Mary, go ahead. Mary? Well, it would help if I hit the button. (laughs) Go ahead, Mary. Hi, George. Hi. Uh, You know how you reported not too long ago that uh, in China they had a a cat that was growing uh, wings on its side? Well, like, you know, today we're working with all this uh, uh, transgender stuff with uh, mixing humans uh, with animals and uh, how we have... Uh, all these underground cities, uh, and I believe that we obtained uh, this very same level of technology years before the Great Flood, and we screwed up the planet, and, and, and you know, we blew it. And, um, you know, all the uh, enlightened, you know, after we did that, there was all these enlightened people underground, and I believe that the uh, the fallen angels were actually astronauts that were coming back to our planet. And after years, there was all these people, you know, just that were not from underground, did not have any technology. And they looked upon them as, as angels and gods. And I read a book called The Search for Angels. And, if, you know, the first angels were seen coming down from a mountain. They were tall men. They were really, you know, white skinned, and they had long hair, white, and long beards. And, and, I, and I believe that they were astronauts, and there were, huh. uh, you know, enlightened beings, and there were all these other people that uh, didn't have a clue what was going on. And, what do you, you think know, of that theory, William? Let's get his take. Well, um, this goes back to Enoch, who we discussed earlier, who was taken up into heaven as the sole pure example of this pre-flood civilization that she's describing. Enoch was taken because he was a a master of this esoteric lore. He was pure-hearted, and as a result of that, he's taken up into heaven and transformed into the archangel Metatron, who some claim is actually a seraphim. 
So I think that there was an effort on behalf of whoever this, this being was, in this case, Arch, the Archangel Michael and whoever he was working under, to save an element of humankind that perhaps we did misuse technology, as so many people believe. Perhaps we're in the midst of doing that now. And by the model of Enoch, I would say that the, the way that the place we want to focus our energy and emotion and time is how we transform ourselves into these glorious light beings rather than the technology. That This Wait. is the way out. Before we go back to final calls, take just a moment to tell us what's new on WilliamHenry.net and also Soul Rising. Uh, thank you very much, George. Yeah, I'm introducing my, my, uh, the new iteration of my website, WilliamHenry.net, uh, which features Soul Rising and my new DVD set, The Awakening, The Transformation, The Ascension. It's uh, largely artwork-driven, George, because the belief here is that the secrets of the light body, of the rainbow body, are transmitted not in writing, but through artwork. The belief is, is that this artwork itself can transmit these, this energy and these secrets. So I've got perhaps the world's largest collection of this rainbow body art and transfiguration art included in this presentation. And people that have seen it live and in, also on the DVD are telling me that it just it literally lights them up. It does transmit this energy. And I'm thrilled to, to offer that to people as a DVD set and also as a, uh, an 11 by 17 book of frameable art. Good for you. What do you prefer, DVDs or books? You have fun doing both. I love uh, I love DVDs. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy. I mean, one of the best and uh, favorite things that I, I get to do is to interact with audiences and, and share this with people and see the expressions on their faces as they as the as this artwork lights them up and transforms them. People still want books, but but more and more I, I see the DVD as the vehicle of the future. Thomas is in Warren, Michigan, first-time caller. Hey, Thomas, go ahead. Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? Okay, thank you. Yeah, my uh, question has to do with all the illustrations and artwork that you have researched. These guys who did the artwork didn't obviously live in the same time period, and if they did, they couldn't possibly talk to each other. Have you looked at the origins of, say, where did they come up with the concept that there's anything in common with the illustrators themselves? Ancient you know, artwork in the illustrations. Go ahead, William. Yeah, some of the icons of, especially the transfiguration of Jesus, are considered to be contemporary representations. Uh, you're right, there, are, there were eyewitness accounts to these events, but there are no photographs. So we are dealing with artistic interpretations that are strikingly consistent across the ages and across uh, different cultures. And that's what fascinates me. In other words, the way the Tibetans show this is the same way the Christians show it. So they must be either, A, copying each other, or B, pulling from the same kind of source code. And the longer I look at this, the more I think that, they're, that these artists are, people like to use the word channeling, that, that might be a right way, but they're tapping into this cosmic artistic code and pulling down this imagery, and that explains the consistency of this imagery to me. Next up, we go to Mike in Butte, Montana. We'll squeeze you in here. Mike, go ahead. Hey, yeah. Uh, hi, George. Great show. Uh, I wondered what your guest thought of, uh, of the, the symbology of the Arubis. I, th I hope I pronounced that right. And then I wanted to ask him, too, if he'd ever run across in uh, Brad Steiger's book, that uh, Atlantis Rising, the OXO prophecy from that Robin McPherson in British Columbia. And then Casey speaks to the Elaine Vital and that all matter is just electrical, spiritual in nature. So 